with the general theory of square roots, we can now build techniques for solving general quadratic equations. Where this starts, the square root property. Now, suppose we want to solve the equation x squared equal to 9. One method, I could raise both sides to the 1 half power. Okay, so the idea is I want to get rid of that too. Power rule, 2 times a half is going to go to a 1, which is an x. And if I've got an equality and I perform the same operation to both sides, what comes out should also be equal. So we'll get our x on this side. We'll get 9 to the 1 half, which is the positive square root of 9. And so that's just going to be a 3. And our solution is x equal to 3. Now, if you think back, x squared equal to 9, remember, that's just asking for all possible square roots of 9. So we're going to miss the solution x equal to minus 3 if we go with this method. That's the worst thing that can happen, though. So we'll call this the square root property. If I want to solve, okay, say box squared equal to c, where c is either 0 or positive, here, box can be any complicated expression, usually in parentheses. Then I get rid of the square by just going with box equal to plus minus the square root of c. Now, let's put this together in a checklist for how our problems are going to go. First, first step is we can't invoke the square root property until we've isolated the box squared. So that's our first step. Once we've done that, we'll go to box squared equal to c, goes to box equal to plus minus square root of c, the square root property. Then we'll solve for x and whatever is left over over here. So that's going to be two equations. And then when we get our answers, we want to check our work because with square roots, you can't always be sure whether you've done operations that produce fake solutions. We start off slow, so let's consider 2x squared equal to 36. So I want to isolate, okay, here box squared is just going to be the x squared. I want to get the x squared by itself. We divide both sides by 2. So we have x squared equal to 18. Square root property says to drop the square, we just go with plus minus square root of 18. And now we know how to clean that up. Note the biggest square in 18 is a 9, so that's going to go to a 3. And then our solutions for x are going to be plus minus 3 squared of 2. Of course, we check our work. Here we'll just check the negative solution since there's more going on there. So what do we do? I'll put our minus 3 squared of 2 in for x in the original. If you're not sure or you feel uncomfortable using your multiple base rule right here, you just write out the minus 3 squared of 2 two times and then put everything together. So the number part that'll come out is going to be an 18. I've got square root of 2, square root of 2, which is going to go to a 2. And then we get the 36, which is what we were looking for. And then the other solution, 3 square root of 2, same exact work. Next example, let's try 4x squared minus 9 equal to 0. We're still trying to isolate the x squared. So we'll add 9 to both sides to get 4x squared equal to 9. Then I can divide both sides by 4. So we get x squared equals 9 over 4. We can apply the square root property now. So to take away the square, I just put plus minus square root on the other side. That's going to clean up nicely. They okay, squared at 9 over 4 is just 3 over 2. So our answer for x is plus minus 3 over 2. Of course, we check our work. And often we could check both solutions at the same time. If I take plus minus 3 over 2 and put it in the square, for both, they're going to go to 9 over 4. The minus goes away. They both go to a plus. That gives us 4 times 9 over 4 minus 9. 4 times 9 over 4 is 9, so 9 minus 9 goes to 0. And that's what we were looking for. Now, let's try an example where the answer has a little bit more going on. This problem is going to have complex numbers in it. So let's recall, okay, if we're doing square roots of negative numbers over the reals, that's a forbidden operation. 
But if we're willing to work with complex numbers, we'll just take square root of minus one as a symbol, like we would with any other square root. That'll have the main rule, square root of minus one times square root of minus one. That's gonna be what's under the sign, which is a minus one. So, by tradition, we'll call square root of minus one the letter i, and so i times i has gotta be a minus one, or i squared is minus one. Now the problem, let's try 6x squared plus 36 equal to zero. Again, I wanna isolate the x squared. So what do we do? We'll move the 36 to the other side and we see a negative start to appear on the other side. So we know complex numbers coming up. That's gonna give me 6x squared equal to minus 36. We divide both sides by six. We have x squared equals negative six. I now apply the square root property. So to get rid of the square, we'll put a plus minus square root on the other side. And note this minus six, the minus goes into the square root also. So our answer for x is gonna be plus minus square root of negative six. I could think of that as having two parts, the square root of six and the square root of minus one, which goes to i. And then we have our usual two answers, plus minus i square root of six. Of course, we check. So we'll take our answer, put it into the square, the x squared. And as before, we'll do them both at once because the minus solution is just going to go to a plus. So what are we going to get? Well, we're going to have our answer times itself. Okay, as we noted, the, the negatives are going to go away. We have six times. Okay, so there's two i's and two squares of sixes. The squares of sixes go to a six. The two i's, i squared, is going to go to a minus one. And then that gives me a minus 36. We add it to 36 and we get a zero. And that's our answer. For a final basic example, consider x minus three quantity squared equal to five. So here it's not an x squared, it's gonna be some item in parentheses squared. It may be helpful to put a box around things to remind you of where you stop on the square root property. Now, I have isolation already in effect here, so all I need to do is, if I wanna take off the square, we'll plus minus the square root of what's on the other side. And so we've got x minus three equal to plus minus square root of five. We can either break this up into two equations now, or I could just push the three to the other side, giving us x equal to three plus minus square root of five, and then split that into both of our answers. Now, of course we check. I'll check one of these, the one with the three minus square root of five. We put that back in the original, and what you'll notice is, okay, on the inside, because we're doing PEMDAS now, so, parentheses first, the threes are gonna go away, leaving you with a minus square root of five. We square that, so I multiply it by itself. The negative sign goes away, leaving us with a square root of five times a square root of five, which is a five, and that's what we were looking for. And then you'll notice the other solution, the three plus square root of five goes exactly the same way. Now, with the square root property, we're able to go to applications. So let's consider first application. This one's a straightforward one. Okay, we have the Pythagorean theorem. So recall, Pythagorean theorem, if I have a right triangle, okay, the parts are gonna be, so opposite of the right angle, or call that the diagonal, it's gonna be what we call the hypotenuse. Then the other two sides are the legs. So if we take the lengths of each of those, call them A, B, and C, as in the picture, so C is the, the length of the hypotenuse, we'll have C squared equals A squared plus B squared. Okay, we don't prove this here, but this is one of those facts where, or theorems, where there are a multitude of proofs of this, some of them very clever, and this is a very old theorem too. Now, what do we have in mind? So word problems, we're not gonna do the word problem breakdown for this. We'll just talk through it. We have, okay, a 25 foot ladder leans against the wall. The 
base is 15 feet from the wall, how high is the top of the ladder? So let's draw a picture first. Pythagorean theorem section means we're going to be working with right triangles. So I'll draw a right triangle. The ladder is going to be the thing leaning on the wall, so that's going to be the diagonal or the hypotenuse. So I'll put a 25 there. We're told the base of the ladder is 15 feet from the wall, so that's going to be the leg on the horizontal. I'll put a 15 there. I want to know how high is the top of the ladder. I don't have a number for that. That's going to be an unknown, so we'll go with an X. And we know once I put an X in here, I have all the parts I need to go to the Pythagorean theorem. And so what we're going to get, X squared plus 15 squared equal to 25 squared. So there should be a square there. We expand out, so you can break out a calculator. That's going to give us x squared plus 225 equal to 625. I move the 225 to the other side, which is going to give us x squared equal to 400. Square root property, to take away the square, we're going to put plus my square root on the other side, and then the square root of 400 is 20. So our answers are plus minus 20. Because I'm in the real world, we don't use negative lengths, so our final answer winds up being 20 feet. Of course, because this is a real world problem, you should put your 20 feet back in to make sure there are no errors, because this could have an effect on the real world. For our next application, let's consider the theory of compound interest. If you ever plan on borrowing money or having a credit card, you need to know how compound interest works. Without an understanding of compound interest, it's easy to fall into the trap of runaway debt. So here is where the study of money and how money grows begins. Now, what's the situation? I go to the bank, I deposit $1,000. Suppose the deal I make with the bank is, if I leave the money in for the entire year, they'll give me back 10% of my money on top of the original amount. So that's what we call 10% interest compounded annually. What this means, I'll have 1,000. At the end of the year, I'll get an extra 10%, so 10% of 1,000 is 100. And then at the end of the year, I have $1,100. Simple interest is when you take that $100 home with you, and then you let the $1,000 keep going year to year, getting 10%. Every year, you take your $100 out. Compound interest is the opposite. We're just going to leave our $100 in, and then for the next year, you'll get interest on your original amount and on top of the interest. And then that keeps compounding. It's interest on interest on interest. What's the equation that we use? So we'll have A equal to P, 1 plus R raised to the teeth power. The items here, the P is the initial amount, so that would be like the thousand dollars. The T is the amount of time that's lapsed since your deposit. The A is the amount of time t, and then the r is the annual interest rate, and that's going to be as a decimal, so if it comes as a percent, you need to divide by 100 for use in the equation. Okay, note, if t is equal to 0, the 1 plus r, 1 plus r, the 0 is just the 1, so t equals 0, we get the p for the initial amount. Now, what about the formula? What, where does this formula come from? What's the mechanism that makes interest work? Let's suppose, not necessarily at t equals zero, but any time, I have the amount A at the beginning of some year. If the year passes and I haven't touched the amount A, we'll still have the amount A, but we're going to add, say, the 10% on top of that. So I'll have A plus 0.1A. Now, I can factor A out of that, so that'll be a 1 plus 0.1, or I'll have A times 1.1. So every time a year passes, we multiply by a factor of 1.1. If t years pass, 
then we're going to multiply 1.1 by itself t times or 1.1 raised to the teeth power. So that's where our formula comes from. Now, for some numerical examples, okay, we want to just stick to things we can do with the zero root property. Let's take a look. So first, let's just look at a basic what happens year to year. So if I have $1,000 to start, we'll stick with the 10% interest. So our R is going to be equal to a 0.1. At t equals zero, we'll just have the 1,000. I let a year pass. What do we do? We're going to multiply by the factor of 1.1. Or we'll have $1,100 at the end of the year. We let another year pass, so we're at time two. If I multiply this part of the equation by 1.1, I have 1.1 times 1.1, or 1.1 squared. We work it out, we get $1,210. I let another year pass, so we're at time three. We multiply the 1.1 squared by 1.1, so that's three 1.1s for a 1.1 cubed. We work it out, we get 1,331, and so on. The key thing to note here, we have the initial amount running down as usual, and that the exponent is always going to match the time that we're measuring at. And so that's going to be the model for the formula. Now, we have a formula with four variables. If I have three variables, as numbers, I'd like to be able to solve for the fourth one. We don't have all the technique for that yet, but we can work out an example for the square root property. So let's try this. Suppose our initial amount's $1,000. We'll wait two years, and then we'll have an amount of $1,322.50. That's three of our variables. The one that's missing is the annual interest rate. So let's try to solve for that. Let's look at what we have. We drop our items into the equation. So I'll have 1,322.5 equals 1,000 1 plus r squared. Note, the 1 plus r squared, I can work with that in the square root property. So I need to isolate the 1 plus r squared. We divide by 1,000. That gives us a 1.3225. Okay, so 1 plus r squared equal to the 1.3225. If I want to get rid of the square, plus minus square root of the other side. So I'll take the square root of 1.3225 with a calculator, and then that gives us one plus r equals plus minus 1.15. We solve for r and we get two solutions, one positive, one negative. We throw away the negative one since this is a real world problem. So I'm gonna get a 0.15, or if I multiply by 100 to get a percent, we have a 15% annual interest rate.